Hello guys! In two previous videos I looked at the historical evidence of Jesus of Nazareth, more often known as Jesus the Christ. I looked at historical documents to see him as a historical figure. In my first video I looked at five different primary sources which we still have full copies of today. These five non-Christian sources all talk about Jesus as a real historical figure. And in the second video I looked at two specific sources, that is the references to Celsus's book True Word which are preserved in Origen's book Against Celsus, and the Jewish Talmud. Now I want to do a little bit more continuing looking at those sources, as well as look at some other sources. This time however, instead of looking at the different events in Jesus' life, we're going to be looking at the events of his death. I find this a timely video as Easter is right around the corner, and it's one I'm very excited about because there's some interesting stuff here. So without further ado, let's go! Alright, before we get started, it's important to look at the question of when scholars think that Jesus actually was crucified. Because we can actually narrow down when Jesus died very closely, and with a few things of considerations, there's really a handful of dates which we can choose from. Even many critics of Christianity will accept that Jesus died somewhere between the years 30 and 33. Promoters of Christianity though have calculated a very specific time when Jesus died within that range. It is broadly accepted that Jesus probably was crucified on the eve of the Jewish festival known as Passover, or Pesach in the Hebrew, and that his execution was on a Friday, under Tiberius Caesar. So if all three of these facts are true, Jesus died under Tiberius Caesar, Jesus died on the eve of Passover, and Jesus died on a Friday, then we can really calculate when exactly Jesus died. Because within the reign of Tiberius Caesar, there are only two Passovers that happen on a Friday. The first is a traditional date which most Christians have affirmed for a very long time, and that is on April 7th in the year 30. The other day is one that's gaining a whole lot more scholarly support for it in the modern day, and that is on April 3rd in the year 33. So those are the two dates that we're entertaining the eve of Passover on either April 7th, 30 AD, or the eve of Passover April 3rd, 33 AD. Maybe someday I'll make a full video and dedicated to that, but for now we're just going over the non-Christian historical documents about the execution of Jesus. So starting out, let's look at the Jewish Talmud. In Sanhedrin 43a, 20-21, the Talmud writes, The Gemara raises a difficulty, but isn't it taught in the Baritta, on the Passover Eve, they hung the corpse of Yesu after they killed him by way of stoning, and a crier went out before him for forty days, publicly proclaiming, Yesu is going out to be stoned because he practiced sorcery, incited people to idol worship, and led the Jewish people astray. Anyone who knows of a reason to acquit him should come forward and teach it on his behalf. And the court did not find reason to acquit him, and so they stoned him and hung his corpse on Passover Eve. Ula said, And how can you understand this proof? Was Yesu worthy of conducting a search for a reason of acquitting him? He was an inciter to idol worship, and the merciful one states with regard to an inciter to worship, Neither shall you spare, neither shall you conceal him. Rather, Yesu was different. He had close ties with the government, and the Gentile authorities were interested in his acquittal. Consequently, the court gave him every opportunity to clear himself, so that it could not be claimed that he was falsely convicted. Now this is an interesting passage. Yesu is what Jews often call Jesus, and it is broadly accepted that this is talking about Jesus. However, there are some interesting contradictions to this. This says that Jesus had a 40-day trial, whereas the New Testament says that Jesus got a one-day mock trial. This says that they stoned Jesus and then they hanged his corpse on a tree, whereas every other source says that Jesus received a Roman crucifixion. In addition to this, the passage goes on to talk about how Jesus had five close followers who are not the names of any of his followers in the Christian tradition, but that these five followers were also executed alongside with Jesus. So what do we make of the difference? Do we say Christianity got it all wrong? I think that is highly unlikely. Every other historical source, such as Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian of Samosota, all agree that Jesus was crucified, not stoned. We don't have sources other than the Talmud and the Gospels that talk about rather Jesus had followers who were executed with him, or rather his trial was 40 days or a mock trial. 
These are the points that the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition contradict on, and we don't really have anybody to break the tradition. So far, we've got a strike against this passage in that it says that Jesus was stoned instead of crucified, and we've got two points for the Gospels in that most of those details are multiply attested within the four different Gospels, and that they came earlier. But then there is also some agreement in these passages. They agree that Jesus died on the eve of Passover, and that there is some Roman government trying to get Jesus released. Now, there's one other source that does say that Jesus' followers fled at his execution, although it doesn't say that there were no followers that were executed along with Jesus. So maybe it could be a breaker on another one of these points, but it's not necessarily so. So we're going back to Celsus's book, True Word, and this is the quote preserved by Origen in Against Celsus, book 2, chapter 45. In the next place, those who were his associates while alive, and who listened to his voice and enjoyed his instruction as their teacher, on seeing him subjected to punishment and death, neither died with him, nor for him, nor even when induced to regard punishment with contempt, but denied even that they were his disciples, whereas now ye die along with him? I find this a very interesting argument that Celsus is making. Celsus is kind of confused about something. The same followers of Jesus that ran away from him at his execution are now so boldly proclaiming him that they are willing to now die torturous executions. Celsus's question is like, why? Why were you cowards when he needed you, but now that he's gone and dead, now you boldly stand for him? I think this is a profound question, which a Christian narrative has a clear answer to. The disciples so boldly proclaimed Jesus after his execution to the point of taking death on themselves because they were that convinced of his resurrection. See, when he was walking around claiming to be Messiah but did not have a kingship yet, yeah, they were confident that he was the Messiah, but they didn't have the proof like that. His resurrection was what emboldened them so greatly. But there is more reason, because at his crucifixion, the disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. And part of the Holy Spirit's job is to empower a believer with courage and boldness. Now I'd like to get into one of my favorite sources. This is actually a source that we still have, a letter that we found from a man named Marabar Serapion writing to his son, who is also named Serapion. This one, we've got the actual original letter itself, and I think it's preserved in like a British museum. I think it's debated among scholars of when it was written. Some say it was written around the year 73-75, whereas others say it was written around the 4th century. Maybe 1st century attestation for Jesus' existence? but may not be. Anyway, the letter is about how to handle persecution, and it's a really great read. But here's what it says at the climax of the letter. What are we to say when the wise are dragged by force by the hand of tyrants, and their wisdom is deprived from its freedom by slander, and they are plundered for their superior intelligence, without opportunity of making a defense? They are not wholly to be pitied. For what benefit did the Athenians obtain by putting Socrates to death? seeing that they received as retribution for it famine and pestilence, or the people of Samos by the burning of Pythagoras, seeing that in one hour the whole of their country was covered by the sand, or the Jews by the murder of their wise king, seeing that from that very time their kingdom was driven away from them. For with justice did God grant a recompense to the wisdom of these three men. For the Athenians died by famine, and the people of Samos were covered by the sea without remedy, and the Jews, brought to desolation and expelled from their kingdom, are driven away into every land. Nay, Socrates did not die because of Plato, nor yet Pythagoras because of the statue of Hera, nor yet the wise king because of the new law which he enacted. As said, I think this is a really beautiful letter, and I love the thought on this here. Mara is talking about people who see through the problems of society, stands up and addresses them, but society doesn't want to hear it, and so they slander them, they ridicule them, they haul them off, they, even in most extreme cases, they kill them. This is something that is true just throughout human history. Everybody does it. I, I kind of think it's funny. So many people talk about how the Jews are evil because they killed Jesus. But do we say that the Greeks are evil for killing Socrates? Or the Pythagoreans are evil for killing Pythagoras? Are we Americans evil for killing Martin Luther King Jr.? Now these are but four examples. History is chock full of this. If you want to say that the Jews are evil for doing it, you've got to hold all of humanity accountable. Which sounds like you're really open to the Christian faith if you're wondering why so much of humanity 
is filled with injustice and innocent people being executed by an angry mob. Alright, now let's look at a more complicated part in the narrative. The Gospels in the New Testament tell us that there are some pretty extravagant stuff that happened at Jesus' crucifixion. And I don't mean some trivial stuff either, like what Jojo said over here while it happened. I'm talking about big stuff that we should expect some records of. First off, a darkness over the entire world. Secondly, a massive earthquake. Third, the veil of the temple being torn in two. And fourth, tombs bursting open and dead people getting up and entering into the city. So, where are the historical reports on all of that? Were the Gospels just embellishing and inventing all this stuff? This was a question I had several years ago. Where is a historical narrative of all of this? Like, it's easy enough to think that a whole bunch of historians rejected Jesus, and so therefore they didn't want to write about him. That's easy enough. But when you've got a sudden darkness at midday over the entire world, when you've got tombs bursting open, dead people rising again, I mean, even earthquakes are common enough as is, that won't be a big deal. Really, some of these events, they're just so over the top, they kind of almost seem fictional. It might actually be interesting to know there might be a historical case for some of these. Not all of them, but some of them. And this, I think, is really the most interesting part. Let's look at them. Our first source is a man named Thallus. Now, not a whole lot is known about Thallus. He is believed to have lived in the first century and to have written around 50, so only about 20 years after the execution of Jesus. Now, accordingly, in his third book of histories, he wrote about the darkness of Jesus' execution, which he was like, guys, look, it was just an eclipse. There's nothing supernatural about it. Unfortunately, we really do not have any of Thallus' works, so we can't really go back and read it. Julius Africanus of the second century made reference to Thallus' book in his book, The History of the World. Unfortunately, we don't have that book either. It ends until the 8th century until George Sincellus wrote his book, Chronology, where in it he preserved this reference to Africanus referencing Thallus. Now, it's important for me to include my sources below, but I've not been able to find a full free download of Sincellus' work online, and I've not bought the book yet to read it for myself. I've only seen this paragraph mentioned, but I'll go ahead and read it to you anyway. Sincellus writes, on the whole world, there pressed the most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, in his third book of history, class, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate their Passover on the 14th day, according to the moon, and the passion of our Savior falls on the day before Passover. But an eclipse of the sun takes place only when the moon comes under the sun, and it cannot happen at any other time, but in an interval between the first day of the new moon and the last day of the old, that is, at their junction. How then should an eclipse be supposed to happen when the moon is almost diametrically opposed to the sun? Let that opinion pass, however. Let it carry the majority with it, and let the potent of the world be deemed an eclipse of the sun, like others, the potent only to the eye. Phlegon records that, in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun at the sixth hour to the ninth, manifestly that one which we speak. But what has an eclipse in common with an earthquake? The rending of rocks, and the resurrection of the dead, and so great a perturbance throughout the universe. Surely no such thing as this is recorded in a long period, but it was a darkness induced by God, because the Lord happened then to suffer. So what Sincellus is saying is this eclipse that Thallus mentions, this earthquake that Thallus mentions, and these people rising from the dead that Thallus mentions were all a factor of Jesus' execution. Thallus tries to chuck it all up to an eclipse, but Thallus points out that an eclipse actually can't happen at Passover because Passover happens at full moon. And full moon happens when we see the full light emanating from the sun. We can only see the full light of the moon when the moon is opposite of the sun, or when the earth is in between the two. So when Jews were celebrating Passover, which was when Jesus died, the moon would be on the opposite side of the earth from the sun. But what causes an eclipse is when the moon passes in between the sun and the earth. So therefore, Sincellus argues, this darkness could not have been caused by an eclipse. Regarding the earthquake and the dead rising from the grave, Sincellus just simply points out, what does that have to do with an eclipse? Those things don't happen with eclipses. 
which this all is a really good point. If we actually knew Thallus' source, we don't. We don't know if Sincellus himself has Thallus' source. Sincellus might be writing from Thallus' source, or he might be writing from Africanus' source, which is writing from Thallus' source. We've just lost the chain of connection. So what did Thallus say? We don't know. He might have mentioned an eclipse. He might have connected it with the crucifixion of Jesus. He may have connected it with an earthquake. He may have connected it with people rising from the dead. But we don't know. But now when I was reading that passage, I found something interesting. Since Ellis was not only referencing Thallus, but he was also referencing another person I'd never heard of, Phlegon. So I looked up Phlegon. Phlegon was a second century historian, and he also wrote history books. Unfortunately, we don't have Phlegon's writings either. Unlike Thallus, though, we don't just have a reference to a reference to something he supposedly said. We actually have an exact quote of what Phlegon said. And we actually have multiple church fathers referencing Phlegon. So it's actually very likely that Phlegon wrote what they actually claimed that he wrote. Let me read it real quick. In the fourth year, however, of Olympia 202, which would be the year 33, an eclipse of the sun happened, greater and more excellent than any that had happened before it. At sixth hour, day turned into darkness, so that the stars were seen in the sky, and an earthquake in Bithynia toppled many buildings in the city of Nicaea. Phlegon's account is referenced in Jerome's writing in the 4th century, in his book The Chronicles. He writes, Jesus Christ, according to the prophecies which had been foretold about him beforehand, came to his passion in the 18th year of Tiberius, which would be the year 33. At which time we also find these sayings written verbatim in the commentaries of the Gentiles, that an eclipse of the sun happened, Bithynia was shaken by an earthquake, and in the city of Nicaea many buildings collapsed all of which agree with what occurred in the Passion of our Savior. Indeed, Phlegon, who is an excellent calculator of the Lampads, also writes about these things, writing thus in his thirteenth book. In the fourth year, however, of Olympia 202, an eclipse of the sun happened, greater and more excellent than any that had happened before it. At sixth hour, day turned into dark night, so that the stars were seen in the sky, and an earthquake in Bithynia toppled many buildings in the city of Nicaea. These things are according to the aforementioned man. So from Jerome's writing, we get the exact quote from Phlegon, and we get the exact citation from Phlegon. That is, in his 13th book of the Olympiads. Remember that, 13th book of the Olympiads. Phlegon was also referenced by Origen's book against Celsus. In book 22, chapter 33, he writes this. And with regard to the eclipse at the time of Tiberius Caesar, in whose kingship Jesus appears to have been crucified, and the great earthquake which then took place. Phlegon too, I think, has written in the 13th or 14th book of his Chronicles. So Origen is saying that Phlegon wrote about an eclipse and an earthquake in the time of Tiberius, and Origen is not quite sure of whether he wrote it in his 13th or his 14th book of Chronicles. Philippon of the 6th century also writes in his book On the Making of the World. And of this darkness, Phlegon also made mention in the book of Olympiads, for he says that in the fourth or second year of Olympia 202, an eclipse of the sun happened, of a greatness never formerly known, at the sixth hour of the day, it was night, so even the stars of heaven appeared, and it is clear that it was the eclipse of the sun that happened while Christ the Master was on the cross that Phlegon mentioned, and not another. First from his saying that such an eclipse was not known in formal times and also because it is shown from the history itself concerning Tiberius Caesar. For Phlegon says that he became king in the second year of Olympiad 198, but the eclipse happened in the fourth year of Olympiad 202. So Philippon is calculating when Phlegon says that Tiberius became king, and when he says that the eclipse happened, based off of this calendar system called the Olympiads, which the Olympiad was a calendar system very similar to the Julian calendar system, except it cycled every four years. So it's a pretty easy system to calculate. You just have to know when the first Olympiad was, and then calculate from there, multiplying by fours. And then, of course, lastly was a reference from Sincellus. Phlegon records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun, from the sixth hour to the ninth. Manifestly, that one which we speak. Now again, Sincellus is adding a couple details that are not in Jerome's exact quotation. According to Jerome's quotation, 
Phlegon only says when the eclipse started, at the 6th hour. Syncellus is adding that it ended in the 9th hour. Syncellus is also adding that it happened at full moon. Now I think that these Phlegon sources are very interesting, because there is a lot of commonality between these different sources. Yeah, they embellish the information differently, but there is a lot of commonality. They all say that Phlegon mentioned an eclipse and an earthquake. Even those that cited it, cited it specifically to his 13th book. Although Origen was confused whether it was his 13th book or his 14th book. The fact that there is this much commonality between all, I think, does raise the credibility of being an actual source. Just because we don't have it anymore doesn't mean it's not valid. And then we can clearly see that some did embellish it. How much the later ones embellished, we don't really know. We can assume that they embellished some of the more extreme details, such as it being full moon on a Friday, lasting three hours. The rest of it seems to be pretty authentic. Hey guys, quick edit. So the website that I got a lot of these Phlegon sources from, it has gone down in the making of this video. So I had to backtrack a lot of these Phlegon sources and had to look for new websites to cite from. Most of the sources I was able to refine, but it's going to be messy in the sources down below. I was not able to find Philippon's full book, but I did find this quote multiple times. There's one source from somebody called Agapius that I was not able to refine, so I just removed that one from the video entirely. While I was looking to regather these sources, however, I did come across another source that I had not seen before. This is Tertullian's apology to the governors of Rome. He says the following in the 21st chapter of his book, The Apology. In the same hour, too, the light of day was withdrawn, when the sun was at the very time in his meridian blaze. Those who were not aware that this had been predicted about the Christ, no doubt thought it an eclipse. You yourselves have the account of the world portent still in your archives. So Tertullian isn't citing any specific non-Christian sources about this eclipse, but he is writing a letter to the governors of Rome saying, you guys have these reports in your archives. Now, we don't have those Roman archives anymore today, but I think the governors at the time would have been able to have looked in their archives to see if Tertullian really was telling the truth or not. So although we don't have any specific source, it is clear that Tertullian is referencing at least one source, maybe multiple. Maybe he's referencing Phallus, maybe he's referencing Phlegon, maybe he's referencing both, maybe somebody else, we don't know. But we do see a claim of the Roman archives having accounts of this world eclipse, or world portent as they called it. But it does raise a different question if you're paying attention. Phlegon says that this eclipse and earthquake happened up in Bithynia in Nicaea, which is in modern day Turkey, about seven, eight, nine hundred miles away from Jerusalem. Now, I don't think an eclipse can actually reach a full 700 miles, and even if it can, I don't think it can on that vertical of an axis. But then again, as Syncellus points out, you can't have an eclipse in full moon either, nor can you have an eclipse last for three hours. This is not a normal eclipse, and the church fathers aren't claiming it is. The gospel authors aren't claiming it is. The gospel writers say it was across the entire world. Now, what does across the entire world mean to the ancient world? Did they mean the entire Roman world, or the entire world? We could easily get away with just the entire Roman world, but this did get me searching. And the thing that really blew my mind is we actually do have a report of an eclipse happening around this time, either late 32 or early 33, from China. Emperor Guangwu came to the throne around the 25th year, and it is written about the 7th year, which would be late 32 or early 33. It's written in the History of Latter Han Dynasty, Volume 1, Chronicles of Emperor Guangwu, 7th year. Yin and Yang have mistakenly switched. The sun and the moon were eclipsed. The sins of all people are now on one man. Pardon is proclaimed under heaven. Also in the text, In the day of Guihai, the last day of the month, there is a solar eclipse, the emperor avoided the throne room, suspended all military activities, and did not handle official business for five days. Also written in the History of Latter Han Annals, number 18, Gui Hai. Eclipse on the day of Gui Hai. Man from heaven died. Now, these sources predate Christianity's presence in China. At least, as I'm told. So I found the document, History of the Latter Han Dynasty, Volume 1, all in Chinese, but not all in English. I only found these quotes in English. I'm relying on a Christian missionary's translation of these, which he included in his book. I'll include the link, but I'm not able to dig any further than that. According to some reports I've heard, this Day of Guihai does calculate right down to April 3rd of the year 33. I am not able to confirm that. I don't know. But I think this source is very interesting. 
why does China and Greece both have extreme stories of an eclipse happening in the very same year? And this year aligns with one of the dates given for when Jesus died. I can't comprehend how all this would come together except with the story that the New Testament gives. Unless church fathers from across 700 years were all quoting the same bad source, and unless these Chinese missionaries are giving this same bad translation, then I don't really know what else to make of this other than that the Christian narrative is true. What kind of naturalistic explanation can equate for a worldwide solar eclipse that in some regions is accompanied with an earthquake? I've got a theory, but this video is really long enough as is, so I might do another video on that. Hi guys, Editor Kenton back again. So this video is not as long as I was thinking it would be, so I'm going to go ahead and cover what I think a possible naturalistic theory for this eclipse would be. As said, it seems clear that it was not a natural eclipse, because natural eclipses cannot happen in full moon, nor last for three hours, nor do they cover the entire world. So if these sources are valid, how do we account for them? My best guess to come up with a naturalistic explanation is that around this time, a large exoplanet came flying through the solar system and just so happened to pass between the Earth and the Sun, causing this eclipse. Now this would be a very large exoplanet. I'm not an astronomer to calculate how large or how close it would have had to have come to the Earth in order to block out the Sun for the entire Earth. Given what I know from lunar eclipses, if this exoplanet passed as close to the Earth as the Moon, then it would have to be about four times as large as the Earth itself. I'm also not sure if that would cause an eclipse for three hours or not. But then this exoplanet would have just sailed on past, leaving the solar system never to be tracked again. Now, what would actually happen if a planet this large came this close to the Earth? Would its gravity have just flung us off orbit? That is a strong possibility. So I'm not sure that this naturalistic explanation really works or not. If it does work, however, then it could actually even explain the earthquake. If this massive planet came flying by the Earth, then its gravity could have at least caused some vibrations in the ground. But even if this is a valid argument for what happened, then I don't think it disproves Christianity by the slightest. What are the odds that while the most influential person in all world history was dying, a large exoplanet flew by in our solar system blocking out the sun for the entire Earth? The odds of the timing are just so unlikely that even if that was the case, I think it's still strong evidence that Christianity is true. It would be too much of a coincidence. Now, note that I did consider the tombs bursting open and dead people coming around as to be later embellishments to the Phlegon quote and Thales quote. So should we be concerned that there is no historical mention of that? I'll let Braxton Hunter handle that one. Yeah, so Matthew chapter 27 here, we don't know uh, what became of these people afterwards. This is the only uh, gospel that gives us this story. What, do we, what does it mean by many? Many could simply mean, it could be a half dozen. That would not give us this sort of the Jerusalem scene from World War Z where zombies are just breaking down the walls and it's just flooding out everywhere. That sort of a cartoonish sort of an element often gets brought into questions about the stories of the Bible, but it doesn't say that. What we have here are some people probably who recently died, sort of like the Lazarus sort of thing, godly people who were then raised, how many we don't know, and they went into town and they interacted with some people. And the claim that Christianity isn't true because you can't find anyone who wrote about this other than uh, these Christian sources is just an argument from silence. So do we have any reason to believe that the gospel authors just made this stuff up and that never happened? We've got no evidence of it? Nope. We actually have surprising evidence for it. But anyway guys, thanks for watching and keep the faith.